Society 13 Podcast Network. Redefining podcasts. Do you like to listen? Hey, spooktacular people. Stephen Pappas here again. Look, I don't know what happened last time. I got separated from Diane and Denise. I'm not really sure where I am, but I want to take a quick second to reiterate my point from before. Every episode of History of Ghost Mob is entirely listener supported. If you'd like to support the show, click on the support the show tab at historyghostbump.com. Okay, I have to run. Something's creeping around here, but I'm not really sure what it is. I'm going to do my best to get back to y'all really soon. Okay, I have to go. Hopefully you'll hear from me again. tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump Podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 190th episode of the History Ghost Bump Podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. On today's episode, we are going to a ghost town called Bodie, which is in California. This is probably one of the most best preserved ghost towns in all of America. And a lot of stuff has been left behind, and it is taken care of by the state park system there in California, so they keep it in pretty good condition. This was suggested to us by our listener, Debbie Miller. We also are going to have the 13th installment in the third series of Tim Prassel's Spectral Edition. It was cool, Denise. We got to meet one of our spectacular crew members and executive producers, Kathy Webb-Thomas, at Animal Kingdom this weekend. Yeah, so it was really cool, kind of unexpected, but they were on their way, so we hung out and got to have lunch with them. Yeah, that was great. We got to meet her husband, Gavin, so had a great time hanging out with you guys. We want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Vanessa. Hey, Vanessa. Therese. Hello, Therese. John. Hey, John. Janet. Hi, Janet. Jen. Hey, Jen. Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Christina. Hey, Christina. And Jamie. Hey, Jamie. And now, this moment, Naughty. And this moment in oddity was suggested by Kathy Webb Thomas. The story of the Cadaver Synod is horrible and involves having to follow the succession of many popes, as during this time in history, they had a penchant for dying, usually by murder. The United Empire under Charlemagne was crumbling, politics were heavily involved with the papacy, and in order for someone to ascend to pope, he needed the backing of political leaders. Pope John VIII was ruling at this time, and he felt threatened by a bishop named Formosa because he was a great missionary and he was gaining political power. He even seemed to be ruling over more than one place at a time, which was against the law, and so he had him excommunicated. Pope John was later murdered by poisoning and a violent bash to the head. His successor reinstated Bishop Formosa. Two more popes followed, and then Formosa became pope for five years. He died of a stroke. His successor died 15 days after gaining the papacy, more than likely poisoned. Pope Stephen VI was next, and he decided he wanted Pope Formosa dug up to face a trial for his crimes of ruling over more than one place at a time and for seeking the papacy. It was January of 897 when the rotting corpse was put to trial at the Basilica San Giovanni Laterano. The irony here was that Stephen was guilty of the same crimes. This fact may be why Stephen wanted the trial. He reasoned that if he could find Formosa guilty, then any appointments he made would be null. One of those appointments was Stephen's, and it would erase his crime of ruling over more than one place when he was appointed to bishop. There are those that think Pope Stephen VI was really just insane. The corpse was dressed in papal robes, and Stephen screamed and ranted at it. Formosa was found guilty, and his three blessing fingers were chopped off. 
He was reburied in an obscure grave and then dug up again and thrown in the Tiber River. The Roman people finally threw Stephen into prison after this fiasco, and he strangled to death there. Formosa's body was finally recovered and buried properly. But the story behind the cadaver synod and what happened to him before reaching his final resting place certainly is odd. Afraid of the dark? <laughs> That's just silly. What you should be afraid of is the thing that watches you sleep. <laughs> and now, this month in history. During the month of March, on the 25th, in 1911, a raging fire at a New York garment factory kills 146 people. The factory belonged to the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. It was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th stories of the Ash Building in Greenwich Village. The company employed mostly young immigrant women of Jewish and Italian descent. They worked long hours, six or seven days a week, in very bad conditions for as little as $5 a week. Part of the poor conditions was the fact that managers locked exit doors to keep employees from taking unauthorized breaks. This proved to be deadly when the fire broke out in a scrap bin. Fire marshals figured a cigarette or match had ignited the scraps, although arson for insurance purposes was entertained, as the company had suffered four other suspicious fires previously. The fire spread quickly. As many as 50 of the victims jumped from windows to escape the flames. The rest died from burns or smoke inhalation. The tragic event brought to the forefront workers' rights and a need to stop dangerous working conditions. This was one of the deadliest industrial disasters in American history. The town of Bodie in California is probably one of the best preserved ghost towns in America, and the town describes itself as being in a state of arrested decay. There are over a hundred structures still standing today, with many of them dating back to the late 1800s. The town is a state historic park maintained by the California State Park System. In its heyday, it played home to gamblers, miners, gunfighters, and prostitutes. It went boom and bust quickly, and then was left abandoned. Some would claim that it is not completely abandoned, the spirits of those who lived during Bodie's glory years seem to still be around, as if waiting for another rich strike to bring the people flocking to the ramshackle buildings. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the ghost town of Bodie. The California gold rush began on January 24, 1848, when gold was found in the western Sierra foothills. We've talked about this on previous episodes. There was a prospector. His name was James W. Marshall. He was working in an area known as Sutter's Mill in Coloma, California, and he found gold. And boy, when that news hit, it traveled fast, and some 300,000 people came from all over the world hoping to strike it rich here. Most panned for gold, collecting little more than some gold dust, but others dug and blasted mines in search of the mother lode. Four prospectors decided to travel into the eastern foothills on the other side of the Saharas, 10 years after the start of the gold rush, and there they found gold but decided to keep it a secret until they could dig more out the following spring. So they learned from this influx of people that if you find something, you better keep it quiet or else they're going to come and get it. This area would come to be known as Bodie Bluff, named for one of those four men, W.S. Bodie. No one is sure if W.S. Bodie's first name was Wakeman or William. He'd been a tin manufacturer in Poughkeepsie, New York, before the lure of gold brought him west. He left his wife and two children and boarded the Matthew Vassar for a trip around Cape Horn. He arrived in San Francisco in 1849. He joined up with a half-Cherokee named Black Taylor and two other prospectors, and this group made the strike near modern-day Bodie. W.S. Bodie did not want to leave the claim, and he returned with Black Taylor. Winter was soon upon them, and they needed supplies, so they decided to travel to Monoville. On their return trip, a blizzard blew through and caught the two men. They were lost, and before long, Bodie was unable to continue. He told Black to keep going. 
Bodhi perished and his body was found the next spring. It is believed he died in November of 1859. The find did manage to grow a camp around it, which was named Camp Bodhi in honor of Bodhi. Originally, it was spelled as his name was spelled, which was B-O-D-E-Y. But according to local lore, it was changed to Bodhi, B-O-D-I-E, when a painter got the spelling wrong. People preferred the misspelling, and so Bodhi is what has stuck, and I actually like it better that way, too. The first appearance of this misspelling is recorded as happening on October 15, 1862. By 1861, Bodhi had a mill with 20 miners in residence. There were other bigger strikes in the area, so Bodhi was slow to grow. Nearby Aurora, Nevada was booming, and it was drawing the likes of people like Mark Twain, as we've talked about on his episode that we didn't know until we had done the life and afterlife of Mark Twain that he was actually a gold prospector for a while. Things would change after a freak cave-in at one of the mines in 1876. A huge strike of gold was revealed, and the standard consolidated mining company brought in lumber and equipment. The town started growing with thousands flowing to the area. On May 1, 1877, a man named Silas Smith opened his first store near King and Main Streets. This also became the first post office in town. When a strike at the Bodie Mine in 1878 delivered a million dollars worth of gold bullion in just six weeks of mining, the influx of those with gold dust in their dreams increased even more. And as a matter of fact, stocks in the Bodie Mining Company soared from 50 cents to $50 a share. Wow. That's when you hope that you got in at 50 (laughs) cents for sure. Exactly. I I can't even imagine. I mean, that is huge. By 1880, there were 10,000 people in Bodhi. Of course, with a growing population comes a need for more saloons, restaurants, boarding houses, and of course, brothels. Gambling halls and opium dens opened, and at its height, there were 65 saloons in town. I always love these old ghost towns or old west towns, Denise. There's always a ton of saloons. It's kind of like Starbucks now. There's one on every corner. Exactly, but Starbucks is so much better. Eh, It's still got some addictive qualities to it. Not really. (laughs) People from all over the world came. There were families, but also criminals, miners, prostitutes, and gunfighters. Bodhi worked like every other mining town. Miners would work the mines all day, get their pay, and head straight into the downtown area at night to spend their money on gambling, booze, and women. Violence erupted on a regular basis, so much so that townspeople would check the newspaper in the morning to see if they, quote, have a man for breakfast, end quote. This was slang at the time for somebody being killed the night before. So if you've got all these criminals and fighting going on, you need to have a jail. The Bodhi Jail was built in 1877 at a cost of $800. It was not well built, but despite having many guests, only one prisoner ever escaped, so it must have been built well enough to hold him in there. The building was only 14 feet by 18 feet and had two cells. This jail would be connected to a very infamous moment in Bodhi's history. Over time, a vigilante group had formed in Bodhi, and they called themselves 601. The name has an ominous meaning. Six feet under, zero trials, one rope. So I think you get their meaning there, Denise? Yep. They take uh, punishment into their own hands. And they set their sights on a man named Joseph DeRoach in 1881. Apparently, DeRoach had attended a ball at the Miners Union Hall on January 15th. And he did a really stupid thing. He asked the wife of a man named Thomas Trelore to dance. She accepted, and Trelore was less than pleased. An altercation ensued, and DeRoach left the dance early. Later, Trelore and his wife were walking home via Main Street. When they reached Low Street, DeRoach ambushed the couple and shot Trelor in the head. DeRoach was arrested by the deputy named Farnsworth, who apparently was drunk at the time. <laughs> so, great. But at least he arrested him almost immediately. Yeah, he did get his man, Yeah, <laughs> even though he was maybe falling down while he was doing it. Maybe because he was drunk, DeRoach managed to escape and get away from him. He was recaptured about eight miles away and then locked up in the Bodie jail. What happened next was detailed in the Bodie Free Press and the Reno Gazette Journal in January of 1881. Judge Lynch held his first court session in Bodie early on Monday morning and passed judgment on a criminal whose crime is already recorded and impressed on every mind in the community. 
The tragic end of De Roche, the murderer, was at once awful and impressive. The lesson to be learned from it is easily read, and the simplest mind can fully comprehend it. That a cruel murder had been committed, no one can deny. That the swift retribution was expected, every observing citizen could predict with safety. The excitement of the Sabbath did not die away, and the wrath of the people did not go out with the setting of the sun. As the shades of darkness enveloped the town, the spirit of revenge increased in intensity and developed into a blazing column of fire. It was burning in its intensity and fearful in its results. After the adjournment of the court and de Roche was taken back to his narrow cell, a mysterious committee was organized, the like of which has existed in many towns on this coast since 46 and whose work has been quick and thorough. The committee, it is reported, held a long session and discussed the matter in hand. The session was long and deliberate, and its conclusions resulted in the lynching of de Roche. Denise, I love these old papers and the way they describe stuff. The people's anger developed into a blazing column of fire. Between 1.30 and 2 o'clock Monday morning, a long line of masked and unmasked men were seen to file out of a side street into Bonanza Avenue. There must have been 200 of them, and as the march progressed to the jail, the column increased. In front were the shotguns carried by determined men. They were backed up by a company which evidently meant business, and no ordinary force could foil them in their progress. When the jail was reached, it was surrounded and the leader made a loud knock at the door. All was dark and quiet within. The call had the effect of producing a dim light in the office and amid loud cries of DeRoach, bring him out, open the door, hurry up, etc. Jailer Kurgan appeared and responded by saying, all right, boys, wait a minute, give me a little time. In a moment, the outside door was opened slowly and four or five men entered. Under instructions, the door of the cell in which the condemned prisoner lay was swung open. The poor wretch knew what this untimely visit meant and prepared for the trying and humiliating death. It was some moments before he was brought out and the crowd began to grow impatient. Some imagined the prisoner had been taken away by the officers. If this had been the case, what would have followed can only be imagined. All these doubts were put at rest by the presence of the man. He wore light-colored pants, a colored calico shirt, and over his shoulder was hung a canvas coat buttoned around the neck. His head was bare, and as the bright rays of the moon glanced about his face, there was a picture of horror visible. It was a look of dogged and defiant submission. With a firm step, he descended the steps and came out upon the street in a hurried manner, closely guarded by shotguns and revolvers. The order to fall in was given, and all persons not members of the mysterious committee to stand back. The march up Bonanza Street was rapid. Not a word was said by the condemned man, and his gaze was fixed upon the ground. He was hurried up a back street to Fuller. The corner of Green was turned, and when Weber's blacksmith shop was reached, a halt was made. In front of this place was a huge gallows frame, used for raising wagons, etc., while being repaired. Now it was to be used for quite a different purpose. Move it over to the spot where the murder was committed, was the order, and immediately it was picked up by a dozen men and was carried to the corner of Main and Low Streets. The condemned man glanced at it for a moment, and an apparent shudder came over him, but he uttered not a word. From an eyewitness, we learned that the scene which followed was awful in its impressiveness. The snow had just begun to fall, and the moon, which had shone so brightly during the early part of the night, shed but a pale light on the assembled company. When the corner was reached, the heavy gallows frame was placed upon the ground, and the prisoner led under it. The prisoner's demeanor still remained passive, and his hands encased in irons were clasped. His eyes occasionally were turned upward, and his lips were seen to move once or twice. On each end of the frame were windlasses and large ropes attached. The rope placed around the prisoner's neck was a small one. When the knot was made, it was tested against the left ear. This did not suit De Roche particularly, and he changed it so that it was in the rear. Someone suggested that his legs and hands should be tied. This was immediately done. The large iron hooks of the frame dangled near the prisoner, and the grating sound produced a peculiar feeling. It was at least three minutes before everything was ready. De Roche was asked by the leader if he had anything to say. He replied, no, nothing. In a moment, he was again asked the same question, and a French-speaking bystander was requested to receive his answer. The reply this time was, I have nothing to say, only, oh God. Pull him was the order, and in a twinkling, the body rose three feet from the ground. Previous to putting on the rope, the overcoat was removed. 
A second after the body was elevated, a sudden twitch of the legs was observed, but with that exception, not a muscle moved while the body hung on the crossbeam. His death took place without a particle of pain. The face was placid and the eyes closed and never were reopened. Strangulation must have been immediate. While the body swung to and fro like a pendulum of a clock, the crowd remained perfectly quiet. After a lapse of two or three minutes, a voice sharp and clear was heard in the background. I'll give $100 if 20 men connected with this affair will publish their names in the paper tomorrow morning. The voice was immediately recognized as that of a leading attorney. Only Pat Reddy would have had the courage to face the mob and a yell went up from the crowd. Give him the rope. Put him out. The similar sentences drowned out the man in his voice. His retreat was dignified. While the body was still hanging, a paper was pinned onto his breast bearing the following inscription. All others take warning. Let no one cut him down. Bodhi 601. And when I was reading the Reno paper, it ended with the mysterious committee had completed its work and the captain gave out the order. All members of the Bodhi 601 will meet at their rendezvous. In a moment, the scene of death was deserted. To use a familiar expression, DeRoach died game. He was firm as a rock to the last and passed into the unknown without a shudder. That's quite impressive because I don't know how many people could be slowly strangled to death and not just have one twitch of their leg. Yeah. By 1882, things in Bodie were starting to taper off. The mines were not giving as much ore, and in 1887, the Bodie mine and the Standard Consolidated merged. They would operate as one unit for the next two decades. A fire in 1892 destroyed much of the main street area. It was said that as far as the eye could see down Main Street, there was nothing but the debris of burned buildings. Not a restaurant or a lodging house survived, so the families of Bodie opened their homes to the miners. Things never picked up again, and the slow decline resulted in closed mines, and the Bodie Railway stopped running in 1917. Bodie was located in Mono County, and one family, the Dolan family, had two sheriffs in that county, Sheriff James P. Dolan and Sheriff Bert Dolan. James was killed by a gunshot on July 26, 1915. A plaque memorializes him in the town near the lake, and it says, In July of 1915, the peace and quiet of Mono County was shattered when Sheriff James P. Dolan died as a result of gunshot wounds received while attempting to apprehend two outlaws who had terrorized ranchers a short distance from this location. Outraged by the shooting of Sheriff Dolan, the citizenry of Mono County quickly organized a sheriff's posse, which tracked the outlaws to a location near Mono Craters. Justice was served when both outlaws were killed in a shootout with the posse men. A coroner's inquest determined death caused by resisting arrest by duly constituted representatives of the sheriff's office. I love that the death was caused by resisting arrest rather than gunshot wounds. <laughs> exactly. Sheriff Dole on the 15th lawman to serve that office since the formation of Mono County made the ultimate sacrifice with the fearless determination which had been entrusted to him by the citizens of Mono County. Prohibition added yet another impediment to the survival of Bodie, and by 1932, another fire had destroyed much of the town. The Depression all but shut the entire place down. There were no new strikes, but some mining continued. In the 1950s, Bodie became the ghost town that it is today. No one knows for sure how it happens that townspeople just abandon their homes. Do they have meetings and all decide to leave? Do families leave one at a time until all are gone? What is known about the abandonment of Bodie is that people only packed what they could fit in a wagon or truck. That is why so many belongings have been left behind. In 1962, after years of neglect, Bodie became a state historic park. And two years later, the ghost town of Bodie was dedicated as a California historic site. That's what's interesting, Denise. When you look at pictures of this ghost town, usually when we're looking at ghost towns that are abandoned, it's just these wooden buildings that are falling apart and there's nothing in them. Maybe some cobwebs and rubble from outside, rocks and that kind of thing. But when you look at pictures of Bodie, it literally looks like people left dishes in the cupboards. There's still furniture left behind. It literally looks like the people just disappeared and left the town there. Yeah, and usually if you see that kind of stuff, it's because they've kind of re restored it and put like time pieces back in. But in the case of Bodie, they did not. No, and it looks like they haven't really touched anything because it's all covered in this thick dust. And so it's it literally looks like arrested decay as they describe it, that it's just frozen in time 
as if these people just said, we're all going to leave at once. And that's what amazes me, because you would think if people are getting ready to leave somewhere that you would pack stuff up over time and maybe come back and get some more or sell some stuff off or... And, and I don't know, you have tables that have cups and plates on them. Maybe the parks department kind of put that stuff there to add a little bit more drama to it. Or maybe they were just left that way. It's, it's interesting. One cannot talk about the supernatural occurrences taking place in Bodhi without first talking about the Bodhi curse. There is a superstitious belief about the belongings that have been left behind. People believe that the spirits who remain here guard these items from the past as though they are a treasure. If anyone removes any item, large or small, from the town, that person will be cursed with bad luck. This misfortune will continue until the item is returned. Now, you listeners might be quick to say, oh, sure, the curse of Bodhi. We've heard these before. Kind of like when we talked about Robert the doll. If you take his picture without asking, you get bad luck. Then you have to send him a note of apology. Or there's other places where I've heard if you take anything away, it's like you're cursed with that. Well, it seems like this curse of Bodhi, it's not just another legend. It's the real deal. There's a park ranger there named J. Brad Sturdivant, and he claims that the curse still exists to this day. And he knows this because he has collected many returned items from visitors who claim that they've had nothing but bad things befall them ever since they visited and took home a souvenir. These items run anywhere from old tools to clothing to simple old nails. So it's not even like you're taking something that has real value here. Just, I mean, old nails, who cares about old nails? And yet, if you take them, you're going to get bad luck. I was about to say, apparently somebody cares. <laughs> it's somebody. I, those are my nails. Don't take them, you know. Letters accompany the packages saying things like, I'm sorry I took this, hoping my luck will change. A nail arrived with the following letter. Life since then has been a steady downward slide. It's possible that all the unpleasant events of this past nine months are a coincidence, but just in case the Bodhi curse is real, I'm returning the nail. A letter dated to 1994 reads, Dear Bodhi Spirits, I am sorry. One year ago, around the 4th of July, I was visiting the ghost town. I'd been there many times before, but had always followed the regulations about collecting. This trip was different. I collected some items here and there and brought them home. I was a visitor again this year, and while I was in the museum, I read the letters of the others who had collected things and had bad luck. I started to think about the car accident, the loss of my job, my continuing illness, and other bad things that have haunted me for the past year since my visit and violation. I am generally not superstitious, but please find and close the collectibles I just couldn't live without and ask the spirits to see my regret. So it sounds like this individual had bad luck and didn't realize that it was bad luck and then started thinking about it and went, you know, I've had a really bad year. I wonder if that's why. Bodhi has been the subject of several television programs. Beyond Bizarre from 2000 featured the story of a German man who claimed his uncle visited Bodhi and brought home a small bottle. Two days later, he had an accident on the Autobahn. The uncle's son took the bottle to school to show his classmates, and he had a bicycle accident when riding home. It made the man a true believer in the curse of Bodhi. I really enjoy watching this show that's on the Weather Channel, Denise, of all places to have spooky, (laughs) eerie shows the Weather Channel, who would think, but they have this show called American Supernatural, and it is really fascinating. As a matter of fact, our little I-4, the dead zone here in Florida, uh huh, that we drive through uh, on a regular basis <laughs> all the time, <laughs> was featured on there. Oh, very cool. So I thought that was cool. And they had an episode that featured Bodhi and specifically this curse. Now, there was a mother on this episode And what had happened is she goes there and like most moms, they're going to tell you not to touch things anyway. Right, Denise? Yes. Don't touch anything. Well, she also was specific about don't take anything. So not only don't touch anything, but don't take anything. And she told them, I'm talking about even the rocks. Don't even take a rock off the ground. So these kids know don't touch anything. Well, who do you think ended up taking something home? Um, Probably not the kids. It was not the kids, and obviously it was not her. So it must have been the husband. Yeah, he picked up some colored glass. 
And a little bit later, he ended up in the emergency room. And then her daughter broke her arm falling out of a tree. They made three trips to the ER in a 10-day period. And I think even for the most accident-prone family, three trips to the ER in a 10-day period. So basically in two weeks, you go to the ER three times, and it's not because you've got an illness that's spreading around to everybody. Something's going on there. So the mother knew that she had to break the curse and send that colored glass back. There's more than just a curse here, though. Some say there are ghosts. A house at the corner of Green and Park Street belonged to businessman Jim S. Kane. He worked in the lumber business. The family had a Chinese maid who Kane started having an affair with. And when the wife found out, she threw the maid out into the streets. She was shamed and could find no work in town, despite the fact that Main Street was basically Sin City. The maid eventually took her own life. Her specter haunts the Kane house reputedly. Children who had rooms on the second floor claimed that this heavyset Chinese lady appeared to them. Rangers have lived in this house, and one of their wives wrote of an experience she had. I was lying in bed with my husband in the lower bedroom, and I felt a pressure on me, as though someone was on top of me. I began fighting. I fought so hard I ended up on the floor. It really frightened me. A ranger named Gary Walters had a similar experience in the same room, only the door opened on its own. He also felt as though he were suffocating. Music is heard coming from one of the rooms that is empty. Two other houses in the town are said to be haunted as well. A woman has been seen peering from an upstairs window at the DeChambo house. At the Mendocini house, it is said that people hear the disembodied sound of children's laughter. There's also the smell of food cooking and the sounds of a social gathering. So I don't know if this was a home that they used to have a lot of people come and have parties or why in the world there the sound, kind of a residual smell and sound is frozen there. Bodie Cemetery is haunted by Albert and Fanny Meyer's three-year-old daughter, Evelyn. Some claim she was hit in the head accidentally by a miner's pick in 1897. Her grave is topped with a child angel sculpted from white marble. A man visited the cemetery with his daughter, and she giggled and appeared to play with something he could not see. And there are people who believe that that might be Evelyn hanging out there. Is there such a thing as the curse of Bodhi? Does the ghost of the man whom the town is named for still wander the streets here? Are there other spirits here? Is Bodhi haunted? That is for you to decide. Sounds like an interesting place to visit. I don't think I've ever been to a bona fide ghost town that's been kept up by a the state park system, but where nobody's actually living. There's not something going on there. I know we went to one one time because I remember being really excited because I didn't really realize that most ghost towns were just abandoned towns. And so I was like, we're going to go see ghosts. We're going to see ghosts. And I was just young. We were on a road trip and I can't remember where it was, but I didn't see any ghosts. Almost sounds like you were thinking about tempting some spirits. No, I just wondered if we were going to see ghosts since we were going to a ghost town. So it would have been a case of Tim Bunking if that would have happened. On our next episode, we're going to go to a state that we have not been to yet, Vermont. Vermont, very cool. We're going to be talking about the Eddie Brothers house. There's not a whole lot of haunting going on there, but what makes this location so fascinating is that we're going to get into talking about spiritualism because both of these brothers were spiritualists, supposedly psychics, mediums, and performed all kinds of tricks and acts and things like that. So we're going to be joined by our listener, Reese Dobrik, and she's going to share what she knows about this location. And uh, so we're looking forward to bringing that to you guys. And now we have the 13th installment in the third series of Tim Prassel's Spectral Edition, An Invitation to a Haunting. Welcome to Spectral Edition. I'm Tim Prassel. I've got a ghost report here that is not like other ghost reports. For one thing, the reporters get directly involved. They're invited to do an investigation, and this is their chronicle of what happened. But what's particularly interesting is when there is a sense of the reporter in the article, it's almost always the reporter is making fun of the people who claim to see the ghost. But not this time. This is something very different. The article appeared in the Weekly Messenger from St. Martinville, Louisiana, on July 21st of 1888. The headline is simply, Haunted. 
Near the corner of St. Charles and Jackson Streets is a haunted house, sure enough haunted. It is a fine residence sitting back in the yard which is richly and tastefully laid out with flowers. A letter came to this office last week asking us to make inquiries about the place, that they thought it was haunted or was occupied by a gang of burglars who were making the people in that neighborhood believe that the place was haunted. We went up there last Sunday to investigate it and found the writer, Mr. Loewenberg, pretty correct in what he stated in his letter to us. Arriving there at 10 p.m., we posted ourselves in different places and commenced our watch on the building. It was fully four hours before we saw anything. A light appeared in the backyard and commenced to advance toward the front. We could see the light but could not see anyone carrying it. It suddenly went out. Half an hour after that, a white object appeared on the gallery. Coming down the steps, it went among the flowers. At the same time, the light we had seen came shooting from the backyard and stopped directly in front of the figure in white, who held out his hand and took it. This was more than we could stand. Picking up a good many bricks, we commenced pelting the figure in white. We are positive we sent several bricks through it but it still stood there. Finding no more bricks or rocks handy, we stopped throwing. We watched the figure in the light for fully ten minutes before it disappeared and then went up the side of the house to the roof. It walked on the guttering of that roof for some time and suddenly vanished. We heard chains rattle, bells ring, and several shrieks. It was nearly five o'clock Monday morning before the noises ceased. We left deeply impressed that the house was surely haunted. Those who do not believe that it is haunted, go up there and see. And there it ends. You can almost hear the desperation of the reporter. If, If you don't believe me, go see for yourself. I'm Tim Prossel, and you've been listening to Spectral Edition. I have close to 300 of these articles. I post one each Wednesday on my website, The Merry Ghost Hunter. If you prefer these audio versions of them, I have several of those available too. The name of the website again, The Merry Ghost Hunter. I hope you stop by. Thanks, Tim. We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historygoesbump.com. Denise, if people want to send us feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. Denise, we have an executive producer who has been with us for over a year now. And what we do for those that are giving at the $10 or above level, they get an exclusive design t-shirt for every year that they keep donating to the show. And so I had contacted John to let him know that he was due to get this shirt and what size and what design and all that good stuff. And then he let me know that he actually has started his own podcast, which focuses on Purple Heart recipients. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that's very cool. So we wanted to share that with everybody. You can check it out at wefewpodcast.com. And that's W-E-F-E-W and then podcast.com. So uh, just love that he's doing that for those people who are in the military who definitely have sacrificed a lot if they have received a Purple Heart. And then we have a couple of reviews to share with everybody. The first one is from Christine Leo. Just what I needed. Five stars. I found this podcast while searching for Fairfield Hills, a location I grew up near and still frequently visit because I love it. And after listening to that episode, I was hooked. I'm an organic farmer, so I have a lot of time to listen to podcasts while I work, and History Goes Bump is my new go-to. It's an awesome combination of history and the supernatural. I've already learned so much. The hosts do a great job of keeping you engaged and even making me laugh frequently. I look forward to continuing to listen and getting to know the Spooktacular crew. Well, thank you so much for that review, Christine. And then E9544, I love the show five stars. I love how y'all mix history and hauntings into the podcast. Also, I love the moment and oddity in this month in history. Keep up the good work. Hopefully there will be more podcasts about Texas. Well, of course, there will be more podcasts about Texas coming. And uh, we'll have a couple while we're on the road, I'm sure. So if you're going to be anywhere in the San Antonio area, we'd love to meet up with you. Yes, we would. And Again, just to timestamp this podcast, this is going to be our road trip in May of 2017. Gosh, Denise, that's coming up here pretty soon. Seven weeks. But who's counting? Not me. (laughs) All right. Well, we want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye.
This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to welcome new executive producers, Taylor Grimm, Jamie Ha, and I hope I said that right, and Stacy May. And also, thank you to Chelsea Long for your one-time donation. Thanks. Want to keep the spooks away? Give us a review. 